Alright, so this video is going to be a review of the American Civil War. So, as you would know, the American Civil War is really between, you know, the, the North or the Union or the newly seceded Southern states, which were also known as now the Confederate States of America. And just, here's just a little bit of general information about the two sides um, and really to show some of the differences between the two. Uh, for starters, the North, or the Union, had a much larger population. Uh, you know, right here it says about 22 million people uh, in comparison to the South, where they had about 9 million people. And that's a big difference right off the bat, you know, the, the population size of almost you know, of more than double, uh, that's going to make it, you know, be a major, major advantage for the North, you know, throughout this war. Uh, and about three and a half million of the people in the South, uh, they were actually slaves. And the question really comes up here, whether or not these slaves were, would, could be considered friendly or if they were foes. Uh, obviously, they really didn't want to use them in battle because if they did, uh, you know, arming slaves could be majorly problematic to the Confederates, and it, that's, it worried them. So really, you know, they really only were left with significantly less than even what their total population was. Uh, you know, the North, other areas that they had, they had great manufacturing capabilities. Uh, manufacturing, in this case, uh, is going to play a major part as well in this war when the North is able to pump out war um, resources much, much more quickly. Uh, things like uniforms, ammunition, guns, arms, uh, and such. Uh, being able to pump those out at much faster rates is going to be able to really fuel your army. And then going with that, you had a much greater railway uh, system in the north in comparison to the south. And that is also going to be majorly important because that railway is going to be able to move troops, but also going to be able to move those resources and supplies to the battlefield that the manufacturing is pumping out significantly more quickly than without it, and relying on you know rivers or just over over the land transportation besides um, besides the railway. Uh, the railway is going to be a consistent quick speed. That's going to be you know a major importance of this as well. So one other thing uh, here is that the North. They're going to be the invading group here. Uh, you know, they are the ones that really ultimately went to war um, and are going to have to do something about what what is going on. Um, you know, they're going to have to go and invade, and the area that they're invading is really is pretty large. You know, right here I say that it's larger than uh, Western Europe, and the big difference here is that. When you're invading, uh, you know, it's easier to lose morale and things like that, depending on how it's going. But the Confederate soldiers off the bat are going to be extremely highly motivated. You know, they're defending their home homes and their families, and that right there is a highly motivating factor in itself. Continuing to talk about the both sides a little bit, um, on both sides, you really had... A really big rush of recruits, you know, enlisting into this, uh, and ultimately both sides are going to institute a draft as well when those enlistments start to to drop later in the war. Uh, and by 1865, you have a large number of you know of soldiers that are actually you know in this in this fight and that have fought for the Union and the Confederacy. Uh, overall, you have over two million Union troops uh, and over about 900,000 Confederate troops. Groups. So again, that just really goes to show the the differences in, in numbers and just sheer numbers here, and those numbers are going to you know be a majorly important advantage for the Union, even though they're going to have a hard time really using that advantage you know until really late in the war. Uh, one both one thing that both of the groups really experienced is that there really hadn't been any major wars in the United States for a little while, I mean, really since the Mexican-American War, about 15 years or so earlier than this. So really, a few of the recruits really had any military experience, experience but 
you know, these people that were joining up and enlisting were extremely enthusiastic. You know, they, the idea of war that they actually had was still a really highly romantic view of war. Uh, but when it comes down to it, very few of these people were really ready for that military lifestyle. And that romantic view that they're going to have is going to kind of really start to disappear pretty quickly when you start throwing in the modern aspects of this war. So as I you know, said in the beginning here on the title slide, this is really going to be the first modern war that the world sees. Uh, you know, it's going to be kind of isolated from Europe, and that's why World War I is going to have such tremendous you know, casualties and, and things like that with the, with the newly modernized weapons and warfare. But you know, this is really, in the United States, the Civil War is really probably considered the first you know, major big modern war. And really when it came down to it, both sides were really not prepared uh, for the way technology was going to actually affect the war. Uh, you know, as I was saying earlier, the railroads were going to be majorly important with transporting troops and supplies. Uh, railroad junctions and railroads in general were going to become, you know, military targets that are going to need to be defended. Uh, you have the first ironclad battleships, uh, you know, in a major battle between the two that, that's pretty famous is this this Merrimack versus the Monitor in 1862 and really these ironclad ships are essentially retrofitted you know wooden ships uh, and think of it like you're putting armor on a wooden ship in much in a similar way of you know a knight in medieval times would have worn armor uh, and it you know it slows the ship down but it ultimately allows it to take a, you know quite a bit of a larger punch uh, you know from from the big guns and stuff that these ships are able to have uh, and it's just one of these new modern technologies that you're going to see uh, also, the telegraph is going to be really important for military communications. Uh, the telegraph, of course, is a you know you have these lay these telegraph lines, and it allows really for instant communication between these areas that these lines are laid. And the reason why that's going to be super important is the fact that you can have instant communication from a large distance uh, is is super important in warfare. And being able to you have that communication, you can you know relay where people are, where they're going, um, and you can get that information right on the battlefield in certain cases, or at least nearby, and you know get that and relay that you know to where it needs to go in order to be ready for what you're going to be seeing. Uh, also you have air balloons that are going to be used for reconnaissance. Uh, so you're going to get your first aerial recon, which is really super important as well. They would actually take up these telegraph lines into the air balloons and you know from that distance they could basically use the Morse code down uh, and let people know what they see from that height and they could see troop movements or anything like that you know from from miles away in certain cases and really you know relay some of that important information to the people below so on this slide you can actually see you know some of these technologies uh, right right here uh, you actually have the uh, one of these ironclad ships you can you can see the armor and the big guns coming from the side you know they get the smoke these this this stacks right here um, you know that the smoke comes out of from burning the coal uh, that you know that, that ultimately powers the ship uh, down here you can see the railroad lines uh, and why a railroad you know would be ultimately important and then this right here is a little um, a telegraph so you can, you know, this is how they would push the button down and they would have a code that you could use, a Morse code, uh, and read, you know, you could read and listen to these, these beeps that they would make with dots and dashes uh, and be able to, you know, spread a message. Okay, so another major technology, and this is really one of the biggest changes in technology, is the replacement of a musket uh, to rifles. Uh, and the big difference here is that muskets were typically smoothbore weapons, uh, which meant that the inside was, was of the barrel was smooth, and that the, the, the bullet coming out of it would ultimately be fairly inaccurate, and it was really only good you know, for pretty short ranges. So the difference is, is that the rifle is going to change that completely. So as you can see you know, in here, you can actually see the rifling of the barrel, uh, and why that's so important is that it would actually spin the bullet, and the bullet would, in spinning, actually would allow the bullet to travel significantly farther and significantly more accurate. So you go from being able to shoot, you know, deadly at a pretty short range with the musket to being able to shoot, you know, up to 600 yards or, or in certain cases, more um, and deadly and accurately. So that's a major change. And, you know, the generals and the type of fighting is going to need to really make a 
to change in order to be able to be ready for that type of, of difference on the battlefield. These rifles, as I just said, you know, change the nature of combat when it really comes down to it. And it really, because of how far you could now shoot, it, it started to emphasize the importance of fortifications and trenches. And because by doing so, this gave you a majorly you know, defensive advantage. If you're going to be, you know, below ground in these trenches or in a, in a fort that, you know, it's hard to, to hit um, because of just the, the way forts are, uh, if you can shoot out a good distance with these rifles or some of these larger artillery pieces now, um, that's going to give you a significantly a significant advantage on the, from the defensive. Uh, and these advancements that you know where we've been talking about really lead to some tremendous casualty numbers. You're talking you know battles where you're losing twenty thousand people in certain cases, um, twenty thousand casualties or more, uh, and that's why you have uh, be, you know really upwards of seven hundred thousand deaths uh, in in this civil war. You know there's many different estimates between six hundred thousand, seven hundred thousand, maybe even some more, uh, and that's you know roughly equivalent to you know about five million people today if, if in you know, United States percentage of population anyway. And another really problem was that medical care at the time was really not keeping up with the advances in technology. Uh, you know, you didn't have germ theory discovered yet. So as far as, far as sanitation, uh, it, it wasn't really, wasn't great. And there's a quote here, you know, that I believe doctors kill more than they cure, and that's partially because you had instances uh, where they were spreading infection. They would actually take, you know, someone who is being treated, and they would, you know, they would basically, they need to say they remove an arm, they might cut that arm off, and they'll go to the next person and use the same, you know, tools to cut, to amputate something else on somebody else, um, you know, spreading the, the germs into the blood and such, um, and not sanitizing the, you know, the tools, and, you know, people would die from infection as a result of this more often because of the treatment than from the actual being shot in the battle. Both sides were really unprepared at the start of this war. Uh, you didn't have a national railroad gauge. What that means is that um, the different sizes of the tracks were a little bit different and they were actually farther or closer apart uh, so you know you'd have to be you'd take one railway and then you'd get to a spot where that that train couldn't travel any farther uh, because of this and they would need to you know transfer to a different train and go on um, you didn't have any national banking system you didn't have a tax system in the beginning capable of raising the necessary funds to finance the war uh, heck the north didn't really even have accurate maps of the south so you know part of being unprepared here is going to be you know be problematic when you have all these new technologies that we were just talking about that are going to you know rapidly and very quickly change the nature of of the combat that they had been used to once this war got started with the attack at Fort Sumter by the Confederates uh, you had the north put in place what's known as the Anaconda Plan. And the Ana Anaconda Plan is a blockade of the South. Uh, and you're going to see in, on my next slide uh, the, the extent of that with a, a bit of a political cartoon. Uh, but what happens is, is you have roughly 90 vessels uh, at the start of the war basically patrolling the the coastline of the of the South of the Confederates, and you know, 90 vessels for you know a couple many thousand miles of coastline isn't going to be super effective, and you know, ultimately it's going to let some things through. But when it comes down to it, you know, if it if it stops a ship here or there, uh, you know, if each vessel stops a ship, you know, maybe one a year or or, or more. Um, ultimately, as the war goes on, you know, that's going to add up. And, you know, it wasn't very necessarily effective in the beginning, but as the war went on, those, those resources, you know, added up, and you started to get more vessels and, and such, you know, being appropriated for this, that it, the Anaconda Plan and the blockade really became a major thorn in the Confederate side because it really hurt their ability to have the supplies necessary to deal with this war. Uh, you also had, you know, initial difficulties of distributing the food and the weapons, uh, you know, and other supplies to the soldiers. And as the war get on, got went on, you know, as a result of the production and the, the manufacturing and, you know, the railway system, the North actually got better at the, at this, and the South actually struggled. Uh, you know, they... They were able to import weapons and, you know, ultimately start their own manufacturing in certain cases. They got by, but, you know, the struggles are going to be really apparent later in the war. And 
as you can see here, you have just a you know a picture of, of Scott's great snake. So this is Winfield Scott, uh, his his plan, this anaconda plan to really ultimately choke off and strangle the the South and to keep them and prevent them from getting those supplies that they need. Uh, you can look really closely. You can see ships, and they're basically going to be making you know patrolling motions through their particular areas, attempting to, to block any ships from going into uh, the south and such. And again, they were ultimately a little bit effective, uh, but a little bit effective over a long period of time is going to really start to add up. Propaganda was also a really big thing you know, in this war, and both sides really used it trying to influence and mobilize the you know, public opinion in favor of the war. Uh, but one thing that happened you know, to kind of prevent the propaganda from really taking full hold is that you also have the, the advent of photography here. And photography, you know, when you get brutal pictures and you know, war correspondence now being in at these battles and taking pictures of the of the battles and the aftermath of the battles and this brutal you know harsh reality of what war looked like and bringing that home to the places that wouldn't necessarily typically see this uh, you're gonna have you know, an immediate effect to the public and how they view the war uh, newspapers you know articles and, and and the photography really all play against this propaganda of getting people to try to sign up and it's really interesting you know how that relationship works so as you can see here uh, this is just one of those instances of propaganda and one of the photographs I was just talking about. If you look at the, pic, the this little poster here on the left, uh, you can see, you know, it's talking about the volunteers. You know, they were paying people to sign up, you know, take the bounty while the opportunity lasts. You ultimately, you know, if you sign up, you're going to get some money, kind of like a signing bonus. So why would you, you know, not sign up? It's obviously a great deal. Uh, you know, the draft is inevitable. They're saying that, you know, ultimately, if the draft happens, you're not going to have a chance of getting this money. So it's trying to influence, you know, the public opinion of getting them to sign up. And contrary to that, you you know this these pictures of the battles that you see uh, you know show those harsh realities with showing soldiers dead you know the reporters talking about uh, the casualty numbers at the battles you know it's going to kind of ultimately influence the, the public in the opposite direction so now that we've talked about all those kind of initial things uh, you know we can kind of be Again, and talk about how this war ultimately shapes up. And you really have two major theaters of this war. Uh, you have the Eastern Theater and the Western Theater. And the Eastern Theater is really taking place really in a very narrow corridor, mostly between the two capitals of the Union and the, and the Confederacy. Confederacy. Uh, you have you know Washington, D.C. and Richmond, and they're really only about 100 miles apart. Uh, this Northern Union Army you know, in this area is known as the Army of the Potomac, and their aim is ultimately to take the capital, uh, the Confederate capital at Richmond. And you know, while this is the aim, you're going to have a lot of problems that the, un the Union faces, and many of those problems stem from the fact that uh, they just didn't have really good leaders for this for the most part of this in the beginning of this war. Uh, you have a, a major secession of generals. Uh, you know they don't hang around for too all, too long. Uh, you have you know a number of generals before they kind of settle on Ulysses S. Grant as the main commander later in the war. So this is a map of kind of how these the momentum in the battles kind of took place and, and started, you know, in, in this war, in the Eastern Theater. This is a map, uh, you know, you have, you have uh, Virginia here, this is West Virginia, this is kind of the side of Maryland. Uh, you can see the capital right here, Richmond of the Confederacy, and the capital of D.C., and this is up here is Gettysburg. So you can really see, you know, how this fighting is taking place in such a small area and you know this is going to be you know four years here of fighting in these area between you know the two big major parts main parts of the these armies uh, and we're going to be you know, talking about how that kind of plays out more so in a second here this is just another map of of these battles it also you know does show the the western theater here which we're going to talk about again um, in a second uh, you can see the ships talking about the union blue blockade so you know if you look really closely here you can see you know the how these how this momentum kind of took place uh, you can see a little bit of a key up, up here to kind of explain this map for you um, and this just kind of another just shows you a little bit broader of a perspective of of these early battles in in the civil war 
so the first major big battle in the Civil War is known as First Manassas, or the First Battle of Bull Run, and that took place on July 21st in 1861, and... Overall, this was a really a big embarrassment for the Union. Uh, they have this grand army of the Republic, and ultimately they end up having a very chaotic retreat, uh, you know, back into Washington, D.C. Uh, the, the, the battle was going pretty well for them to start, but uh, it, you get a major momentum shift, and it forces these, these guys all the way back um, to, you know, and running away. You have this, as I said, this chaotic retreat. And it's really funny because you actually had politicians and sightseers from D.C., because it wasn't really too far from the Capitol, uh, coming out to actually watch this battle. Um, kind of like you would almost a sporting event. They're ready, and you know you get this chaotic retreat of the Union soldiers through these people, and it's just, it's just an absolute mess. Um, you have about 800 men killed in this battle, and by the war standards, it's going to ultimately become really low. But at the time, this was actually the bloodiest battle in American history, and the way this took place is it ultimately becomes, as I said, a major shock and embarrassment for the North. And it, it starts to, you know, a little bit just worrisome, uh, obviously. And Lincoln, as president, he begins to kind of call again for trying to get about a, you know, a million men army to help fight in, in this war. Uh, after this battle, uh, a man named George McClellan is going to assume the command of the Union Army. And one thing that McClellan is really known for, at least, is his reluctance to commit to, to a battle um, and not taking advantage of, of the advantages that he had. But uh, you know, one thing that he needs to at least be given some praise for is that McClellan was very good at making an army work and getting them together and having them supplied, having the provisions, being drilled and trained properly, and he was very good at this. Uh, and in fact, uh, he's going to take advantage of about a year of stall in a major, major battles here after this first big one uh, to really build the strength of the army. Uh, but he still, that caution is going to really become a major thorn in Abraham Lincoln's side. So continuing with the Eastern Theater here, you know, now after after and after Bull Run, you know, in 1862, you get a couple more battles that we're going to be talking about here as, as the major ones. There's obviously a lot more smaller battles, but we're just going to be talking about the big ones and how they shifted the momentum of this war. But as I was saying, you know, Lincoln was obsessed with trying to get McClellan to attack. Uh, you know, Lincoln was... The word is that you know Lincoln would you know, spend long nights in the telegraph war telegraph office, you know, studying up on war military strategy, and you know he recognized the advantage that the Union Army had, and, and, you know, from a industrial standpoint and also just a sheer number standpoint, and he was really you know adamant about getting McClellan to to take advantage of that, and so he you know with the, with this pushing McClellan to do it, McClellan does make a move into Virginia, uh, and you know with about a with about 100,000 men, and ultimately, Robert E. Lee, who's the main commander of the Confederate Army, he, again, pushes this Army of the Potomac back, you know, towards Washington, D.C., and from there, Lee is going to go on the offensive. Uh, he hopes that by taking control of the border states, remember the border states are the states that remained in the Union who still actually had slavery, uh, by taking control of these states uh, might be able to get them you know, on board with fighting for the, the Confederacy. It might also convince uh, you know, and persuade Britain and France to join the war and, and help the Confederacy. Uh, they were, there was this big belief about King Cotton and that the cotton industry in the South was, was vital to you know, these European countries so that if, if they didn't get this cotton, you know, and these, these people would ultimately be worried about it and recognize the South and help them in the war. That was the hope, at least. So by making an offensive move here, he's hoping to convince them to actually get into the war. And that leads us to the Battle of Antietam, which took place on September 17th in 1862. Uh, you have Robert E. Lee launch this invasion of the North. And actually, by a major stroke of luck, you have Union soldiers actually find the orders of Lee uh, dropped by a Confederate officer. I think they actually found it in some sort of a hut along the way. And they 
gave it to their commander, and McClellan got hold of this, and he was still ultimately cautious, even though he knew what was going to happen, or at least, you know, he thought he could know. Um, you know, I guess it could have been disinformation, you know, hey, this is what we're going to do, we dropped it, we left it, but then we're going to do something completely different and throw him off, but... You know, this caution allows Lee to gather even more forces before, a, you know, a major attack. And this is a big one. In fact, this is still the single most bloodiest day in American history, and that includes, uh, you know, D-Day in World War II and September 11th. Uh, the Union is actually victorious here. They, they repel Lee's advance, and but the numbers are, you know, a big difference compared to what we were just talking about. Remember, we just said that First Manassas had the largest number of American dead in one day just before at 800. So we're talking over 4,000 people just killed out right and 18,000 more casualties on top of that of wounded so casualty can mean actually someone who was killed outright or wounded it's really someone who's being taken off the battlefield and no longer able to fight uh, because of the bad health care we were just talking about before you know many of these people that are wounded are going to succumb to their wounds because of of the infections and things like that they would get uh, and this is going to be this this right here is more men than in you know in all American wars in the 19th century had been killed up to this place up to this point, and at this point McClellan is going to be replaced with uh, General Burnside. Uh, this is just a quick little quote down here about you know what it was like at Antietam. Uh, you know in the time that I am writing, every stalk of corn in the cornfields to the north was cut down as closely as could have been with a knife and the slain lay in rows precisely as they had stood in the ranks a few minutes before. So that really just talks about, you know, this swift nature of this new type of combat and the new weapons. Um, you know, there was so much firepower that it was just mowing down this corn. Uh, it just paints, I think, a pretty vivid picture of what the, the battle was, you know, like to some extent. Here we are going to take a quick you know, step over to the Western theater of this now. Uh, this is just a, you know, a map of the movements. Uh, the, the fighting actually starts here at, you know, Fort Henry and Donaldson here, uh, and then ultimately moves to Shiloh, and we're going to be talking about that, you know, here in a second. But this is just, you know, obviously the difference between um, the Western theater and the Eastern theater. So uh, the Eastern theater is taking place, you know, in this kind of circle where I make with my mouse right here, um, just to see the, you know, the proximity and where this all kind of fell apart. So the Western Theater, what's the point of the Western Theater? What are they trying to accomplish here? And really, the ultimate Union objective was to control the rivers uh, by the belief, you know, in controlling these major rivers. Uh, it's going to, uh, you know, hinder and, and mess up the Confederate, you know, ability to make war by hurting their shipping and movement of supplies and such. Uh, so... That's what they aim to do, and the man for the job is Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, he is in you know control here in the command. Uh, he is a West Point graduate. He actually had resigned the army in 1854. Uh, there were allegations of excessive drinking, and he you know kind of stepped away from it for a little while. But you know once this war got started, they they brought these officers you know back, and he was ultimately recommissioned for for the Civil War. And the first fighting that you have here takes place at Fort Henry and Donaldson, as I just said, uh, where I showed you on the map just a second ago in February of 1862. And the whole objective here is to take control of the Tennessee River that these forts are on. And by doing so, by taking control of this part of the river, it's going to open up this path for the push into the south, you know, through these rivers, down the Mississippi River. It's going to push the Confederates out of the border state of Kentucky. Again, you know, they, what the Confederates were trying to do with the border states, the North does not want that, so they're going to try to get them out of the border states as, as quickly as they can. And they take control here, and actually, not long after, you actually get naval forces taking control of New Orleans as well, and that is majorly important because, as you hopefully know, New Orleans is actually at the mouth of the Mississippi River, uh, and the mouth co controlling the mouth of the Mississippi River, you know, will allow you to prevent things getting up, getting up from the ocean into the river, and ultimately, you know, two Confederate spots along the river. Uh, you know, along New Orleans, you have the ports, obviously, major important and you have big sugar plantations as well uh, that you know are, are part of the Confederate economy that's going to be really important. Uh, ultimately the Confederates attempt a counterattack at Shiloh the same time um, 
in early April, trying to regain some of the, the momentum that they had here. So they they surprise attack at Shiloh. It's a it's a Confederate surprise attack. Uh, you know, trying to as I said gain some momentum and, and get back the Union and get back some of these spots that they they had lost. And this is a it's another bloody fight, right? We're talking more than twenty thousand casualties. It's a two day fight. Uh, you know, it's extremely tiresome and daunting for these men. But ultimately, again, the Union emerges victorious as a result of these reinforcements uh, and the shelling from Union naval ships along the river. And by taking, by fighting them off here at Shiloh, uh, this this narrow victory is ultimately going to then lead to another victory and capture of Memphis, Tennessee, which is also on the Mississippi River. So right now, the nor- the the North is looking really, really good uh, in the West for sure. So. Doing, you know, having such a, a major, majorly positive thing happen in the West in the in these battles and you know, starting to control a major portion of the Mississippi River, and the, you know the win at Antietam and repelling the advance, uh, really gives Abraham Lincoln some, some positive energy and I guess the ability to, to put forth the Emancipation Proclamation, which we're going to be saying what that is in a second, but. For starters, really, the the North's main goal, at least as Lincoln was saying, you know, publicly early in this war, was ultimately to preserve the Union. Uh, you know, they they wanted to bring the Union back together. That was really why they were fighting. That's why the people wanted to be fighting. Uh, and this really was not about slavery uh, initially. It really didn't. Lincoln didn't want it to be about slavery, uh, mostly because the border states still had slaves. So, and acting against slavery would could could hurt that and turn the border states to the Confederate side with and all the resources and the people that go along with it. As far as popularity goes, not everyone in the North was completely anti-slave. Some just didn't care at all, or some actually put, wanted some slaves, especially in the border states. So. If he had acted, you know, the, the popularity of the war would really have been a lot lower as a result. Uh, and there's a quote here from Lincoln, you know, that if I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing all of the slaves, I would also do that. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would do that. So they're really just showing how much he really was just all about the preservation of the Union and the slavery wasn't publicly, at least, an issue for him uh, early in, you know, in this war. So what is the Emancipation Proclamation? You know, we, we looked at it completely in class. You read it completely in class. Uh, you have a little blurb from it up right here in the top that all persons held as slaves within any state, you know, in, in rebellion against the United States shall be then, thenceforth, and forever free. So that's a really important point right there. So they're saying in rebellion against the United States. Uh, so... What does that mean? That does does this free all slaves? You know, everywhere. Does it free them in the north? Does it free them in the south? Border states. What's the deal? So, really, ultimately, this only applied to Confederate controlled area, and that right there is is like a whoa for some people. It's like I thought the Emancipation actually freed everybody, and that's not true. Uh, and the reason why this is still important, you know, obviously didn't, you know, immediately free a whole number of slaves, but slavery was a major help in the war effort for the South, whether it was agriculturally, uh, you know, weakening this, this slavery what would be a major blow to the Confederacy. And by declaring this emancipation to the slaves in this controlled area, what actually happens now is as the Union begins to creep into the South, you actually get uh, and take control of these, you know, the southern lands. You get areas of that are, you know, being taken control of, and in, with that, the property and the slaves are part of that. So now, as you have the Union Army taking control of these slaves, they're freeing these slaves. In many cases, they're actually just putting them right into the ranks of the army. They're giving them weapons. They're training them, uh, and these become known as contraband, uh, contraband, you know, army members, and you know, talking about the illegal nature of them, um, at least from the you know southern side, based off of the emancipation. Uh, and this is going to be a blow in the Confederates' attempt to try to get Europe to their side, right? This is an attempt to actually dissuade Europe from recognizing the Confederate States of America as its own entity. 
you also get Abraham Lincoln acting with a, in, an executive order, which actually suspends what's known as habeas corpus. And habeas corpus, real quick, is this guarantee that individuals you know, are going to be getting a hearing and they have a right to a hearing before being jailed. So the big thing about this is that now he's suspending that. Lincoln, you know, is ordering the suspension of this idea that they're going to be, you know, able to have this hearing before they're jailed. It actually orders the arrest of anyone that's interfering with the war effort, whether it's aiding and abetting the Confederate States, it's discouraging men from enlisting, you know, in the army. You could actually be detained by the military. You could have a, you know, military tribunal uh, for a trial. You could be court-martialed, depending on, you know, if you were military or not. And that's a big deal. And this is arguably one of the most common controversial things about Lincoln's presidency and the war right here because it really does go against many of the you know of, of the constitution uh, to some extent and you know was it legitimate because it was a time of war you know there's all sorts of arguments you could make whether or not this was a, a good move or a bad move or if it was a fair move or what but ultimately it happened uh, it's definitely a controversial part of, of Lincoln's presidency and this war and such. So as I was just saying, you no, know, a major byproduct of the Emancipation Proclamation is that you now get a large number of black soldiers that are looking to join up. And whether these people were were free northern, you know, African Americans or whether or not they were contraband, you know, from the south that were ultimately, you know, captured and and brought into, you know, the war effort for the north, uh the way they were treated initially, you know, that they there wasn't they were fearful of what they would do um, you know in fighting along the whites and by the end of the war this is going to be a very different picture of how these men were viewed especially by by Lincoln and you know some of the, the generals and such of the of the military because you ultimately get 180,000 men fighting for the union uh, you have 20,000 plus more fighting in the you know, for the navy uh, and that's a big number and these men were ultimately effective in the war they were hard fighting soldiers they were obviously fighting for something they believed in, and again, something they hated, and they were effective, right? Uh, especially if they were ultimately effectively used by their commanders. Uh, most of the, well, a number of these, I should say, came from the emancipated territories, uh, you know, in Tennessee and Mississippi, you know, these valleys along these rivers. Um, you know, I have the number here is 76,000 men actually, you know, were contraband soldiers. In this case, this is more kind of after the war, but your service in the army ultimately, you know, establish these men as leaders, these African-American soldiers as leaders, and it's going to kind of open up them for political advancement during the Reconstruction era, whether locally as representatives or even nationally in certain cases. You know, many of these men became leaders during this time, uh, came from the Army. In fact, you even had Navy men uh, actually getting equal pay in certain cases as your white, white soldiers, uh, and, you know, even had promotion opportunities, which, which was obviously pretty big. Uh, you initially had, the, you, know, you did have the army in segregated units, which meant that you know you only had African Americans in the, in the unit in the regiment. Uh, the officers were typically could be abusive. Uh, the men actually got lower pay. So if you, if you remember from the movie Glory, uh, the big thing is that they were getting get paid ten dollars a month instead of the thirteen dollars a month of a normal enlisted men, and that was you know obviously a big deal and kind of a slap in the face because they were doing the same work. Uh, in many cases, they weren't initially used in. In combat, in fact, they were put into labor and you know forced labor in certain cases as a result of the military service, and that's kind of just it's kind of ironic considering many of these men you know had been slaves and it's kind of kind of just interesting anyway. Uh, also, you had a, a proclamation by the Confederates that if they were captured by the Confederacy, uh, many of them could be actually sold back into slavery or even executed, uh, but. This the military service and the actions of these men is going to really push the Republicans uh, in believing in this emancipation completely after the war and really bringing you know a, equal protection of the laws when it comes to it later on during the Reconstruction era. So you did have the two parties in the North, right? You did have Northern Democrats um, in addition to the Republicans, even though you you know the Republicans were were the big party that won that won the last election here. Uh, but the Democrats had kind of split into two camps at the beginning of the war, and many of them you know supported Lincoln and the war effort. Uh, but you also had 
the peaceful Dems, as they would call themselves, or and they became known as the Copperheads. And they really felt that the Union should actually negotiate with the Confederates. Uh, they really lost popular support for the war a bit, especially after the Emancipation, and the war became a bit about about you know the freeing of the African Americans here, uh, the freeing of the slaves. Uh, so you you know. People were worried about the effects of the war and, you know, how much it was hurting the economy and, and such and, you know, the everyday person. And as a result, they were willing to negotiate to some extent and they wanted to negotiate. And that's one of the, also the reasons why you also get the, the habeas corpus, you know, the suspension of the habeas corpus. Uh, and that's, as I said, you know, some Republicans actually suspected these guys of actually aiding the Confederates. And that's one of the reasons for the suspension of the habeas corpus. The war does drag on a bit. Uh, you know, it definitely feels that way for the men that are fighting it, for sure. And as the result of you know the war and the the popular the popularity of the war kind of declining, for sure, you have the number of volunteering starting to really to drop off. Uh, you have you know the enlisting of the troops becoming a problem. Not really as many people are enlisting, and that is what actually forces the draft. So you start to get conscription laws in the South, in particular first, uh, in April of 1862. It's a requirement for men, you know, between the ages of 1835, uh, 18 and 35, I'm sorry, to serve in the army for three years. Uh, you could actually hire a substitute, uh, which means that you could actually pay someone to take your place in the fighting. Uh, it also you could have one man from every family, especially on a plant on the plantations, uh, as that with 20 or more slaves to actually be exempt from this so that it really in many cases this is a war in the south that's being fought on the backs of the poor for the wealthy aristocratic class in the south and that's right if, if you can pay for a substitute someone else will fight the war for you if you're a rich plantation owner you actually can be exempt from going to the war as well uh, and that just kind of highlights that that rich man's war on the backs of the poor kind of idea the north also would have a draft uh, you know, initially those those bounties you saw on that propaganda poster, uh, it those payments for enlistment gonna, is going to drop off too, and their draft, you know, ages 20 to 40, you know, all men, you could actually avoid the draft by also hiring a substitute or even just straight up paying the government $300, and those laws again aroused the people and f made the people frustrated and angry about about what was going on. Uh, many people were, again, no longer supporting the war when the war became about freeing the slaves, um, less than the you know, preserving of the Union and bringing the Union together. And you get protests erupting in many of the northern cities and even riots. And the biggest example of this is the New York draft riots. Uh, it's a four-day affair. You have you know, over 100 people killed. You actually have the shelling of, these, of the, the rioters by naval ships from the, from the harbor. You have the military and you know, troops from Gettysburg actually called in to, you know, to stop this these riots uh, you know it's a big deal uh, and they're frustrated you know they're frustrated they're attacking African American uh, boarding houses and things like that they're killing African Americans uh, just a lot of people that are very frustrated and angry with the war and they're really showing it here the war also really strains economies uh, just in general the industrial output and such of both uh, the devastation that certain areas face um, you know the how much you need to economic resources you need to put into the war you know it's really straining on these economies and as a result both sides are going to need to find money to be able to pay for this uh, mostly they were getting a lot of money and borrowing it through bonds to people in general. Uh, a bond being a loan by a person to the government with the promise that the government is going to pay back the loan and interest. Uh, and, you know, it's, a, it's generally a very safe investment. And, you know, this is how, how much of the money was actually raised. And you have over $2 billion raised in the North for this fight. Uh, you know, you have about $700 million in the South. And that's probably a product, again, of the differences in population and the differences in, in how these societies made their living, uh, the South being predominantly agricultural compared to the industrial booming North at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. 
you know, another way of trying to raise money, you actually have the income tax instituted. And even through this, you know, it wasn't enough. And as a result, both sides start printing money. And if you know anything about, you know, economics, that when you start throwing a large number of dollars into the supply, you're going to get what's called inflation. So you get the printing of these dollars, and for the first time, you actually get a step away from the gold standard in the United States. And this, for, this, for the first time, money is no longer guaranteed and backed by dollars, by, by gold uh, that the United States actually possesses, and it's actually backed on the promise by the United States that this is actually worth something. And as you start printing more and more of these money, as I said, you, you begin to actually increase the supply of money, and that leads to a major inflation and the prices of things actually rising. And what's, when that becomes problematic is when the prices actually rise and you know, raise faster than wages. So say, you know, just for an example, if someone makes, you know, $50,000 a year and all of their expenses are, are, you know, roughly, I don't know, $2,000 a month, that with inflation, all of a sudden, that though your expenses are $3,000 a month or $4,000 a month and your wages that you're making actually stay the same. Uh, that's when it becomes a major problem. Right, uh, you get the general increase in prices, and this is very problematic for the working class people who work in the you know in the factories and stuff in the north, pumping out um, you know goods for the war. Uh, and while the economy is actually booming in the north as a result of the the industrial needs for the war, and also the the farmers are prospering because of the amount of food that needs to be eaten by the army, uh, you still get this inflation hurting these people that the wages don't actually increase for. Uh, you get about 80% inflation in the north, which is pretty incredible, but the south was really hurt with this, where you're talking up to 9,000% inflation. Uh, that's just pretty crazy when it really comes down to it, and that's going to really hurt the south, obviously. And it did, right? The, the factories in the South were really overburdened from the war effort. You didn't have so many of them to begin with. Uh, the ones that were created and made, you know, didn't really, they lacked the industrial capabilities of the North uh, with, you know, so few of them. Uh, it really didn't, they weren't able to cover and provide the necessities for the army that they needed. Uh, again, this war is predominantly being fought in Confederate territory. So, you know, farms are devastated by the war. The rail lines that the South did actually have are devastated by the war as well. Um, you know, preventing this, the, the movement of supplies and, and such uh, really affecting the South in the long run for sure. And the blockade, the Anaconda Plan, uh, began to prove even more and more effective as the war went on. And it caused severe shortages in goods needed by the military. And that started to lead to desertion by the men and such, and that was another problem the South faced. So now we're going to be kind of going into the later stages of the war, especially on the eastern uh, the side. You know, you get this this some more action here moving on, uh, and the big you know fights are going to be between Fredericksburg at Chancellorville and then ultimately Gettysburg. And you're just looking at the map here, you can really see how the location of this is going to really affect things, especially at Gettysburg. Uh, and we're going to explain why, but I just want to show you before we move on here how close Gettysburg is to some major Union cities. Right, it's not that far from Washington D.C. Uh, it, it's not that far from you know Philadelphia, which would be kind of right around here. Uh, New York City is obviously also not not too far. Uh, so you know that is that's big, right? If the Confederacy was able to win here, you know it might actually force a coming to terms by the Union as a result of the proximity to these big these big um, these big cities. So Fredericksburg, what happens here is you actually have an attack. It's an attack by the Union, uh, and that gets beaten, gets you know repelled completely, uh, gets repelled completely, and it just forces uh, them back. The Union back, you know, they're attacking this entrenched position, you know, these defensible positions, uh, and they get devastated. Burnside was the general in charge here at the time. Uh, he's actually resigns after this in, in kind of embarrassment. Uh, and that actually gives Lee, the 
the idea and the you know, they believe it a good idea to start kind of pushing you now into Union territory again. So at Chancellorsville, you actually have Lee win another another victory, you know, over the Union, which is again a, a, a big surprise and you know a big. Um, showing the, di the differences between the, the two troops here. Uh, and you actually have General Hooker, uh, who had taken over. He does not, you know, obviously doesn't do such a great job here. Uh, but you get large casualties on both sides. But, you know, this win here at Chancellorsville actually allows the Confederates to build up the momentum that it needs to ultimately push north to Gettysburg. And Gettysburg is the real deal. Uh, Gettysburg is actually the largest battle that's ever been fought on the North American continent. If you actually go through the notes, you can watch a small little video by clicking on the link uh, about the battle in a bit, a bit more specific detail. But this is a really important move by the Confederacy. What they're really hoping to do here is by actually pushing into Union territory, uh, you know, and if they were able to actually win a battle here, uh, it would actually force the, it could force the North's hand, uh, and, you know, the, the hopes that they would actually be able to come to terms with the North and, and, and negotiate for their freedom is what they're really hoping here, um, their freedom, you know, of, of being able to be their own Confederate States of America, completely independent from the Union, and it was could have gone either way. This battle was, was pretty big, and, you know, it was the course of a couple of days, and it really could have gone any way. Uh, you know, there's a the big move here at the end, and this is really the downfall of the Confederate Army here, and arguably Robert E. Lee's, you know, biggest mistake he makes is what's known as Pickett's Charge. Uh, he completely... Throwing caution to the wind a bit, Robert E. Lee forces his, you know, his group, his men to to attack an entrenched Union position across this giant open field. Uh, they're just getting picked off by artillery and the rifles uh, left and right, and it really hurts the Confederacy, hurts the men. Um, you know, you get a large number of people killed here, and they they kind of lose their, that momentum that they had had, and any real hope of of coming to terms at this point anyway um, with the Union. Uh, you you get the Gettysburg Address by Abraham Lincoln a bit later that we, we, we read in class, so you can you know, read the handout again, um, talking about this war and, and the biggest honor to these men that they could show is ultimately finishing and completing this war effort and you know, bringing the South you know, fully back into the Union. So now a quick move back to the west here, and this is just a map, uh, again, of the Western Theater, you know, down the Mississippi River. Uh, we're going to be talking really about Vicksburg here, uh, because this is happening roughly the same time as Gettysburg. It's a couple months of a siege of this town on, on these bluffs above the Mississippi River, uh, but... It, the winning by the, the sorry by the Union here happens at roughly the same time as Gettysburg. In fact, it's the victory is July fourth uh, here in 1863, whereas the victory was July third in Gettysburg. So, in just a matter of two days, you have two huge, huge Union victories that are really going to be a major turning point in this war and, and really kind of push it toward its final conclusion once and for all. So Vicksburg was, as I said, this multiple month siege by Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, it's above, you know, these cliffs. This is just an artist rendering down here. Uh, you can see, um, you know, you have this, you know, this cliffs above the river. Uh, you know, the the Union army here, kind of laying siege to the men at, at this area, uh, and it's. You know, it happens, it, it's a big deal, it's a long fight, they're trying to starve out these Confederates, uh, Grant is constantly worried about reinforcements and people trying to push them off this siege and allowing the men to, you know, to link up, the Confederate men to link up with, with other reinforcements, uh, but ultimately Grant is successful here, they take the town and you get, you know, 30,000 Confederate troops surrendering and that, you know, that, that's, a, that's a big, big deal. And you have Ulysses S. Grant as the victor at Vicksburg, ultimately getting the attention that he that Lincoln was finally looking to give. Uh, Lincoln, you know, praised Ulysses S. Grant for finally being the general to fight the the war in a way that made sense to Lincoln based off of the advantages of the North. Uh, Grant's actually going to be labeled a butcher because of his strategies, but his strategies you can't deny were effective, and he is looking to to fight a war of attrition here. He's willing to take high casualty numbers 
to inflict high casualty numbers. He knows of the number advantage between the North and the South, you know, and with over two million men, you know, fighting in the North throughout the war and just over a million, the two to one advantage is a big deal. So if you just are willing to continuously attack, attack and continuously inflict large numbers of casualties on the Confederacy while still doing it to yourself a little bit, but most importantly to the Confederacy, um, if you just keep doing that, you're going to eventually wear them down and crack them. So Grant, uh, you know, he, as I said, gets labeled as butcher. Uh, he has assaults at the Battles of Wilderness, at Spotsylvania Court, Cold Harbor in Virginia. And it just, as I said, just continue. I don't really need to expect you to know those battles off the top of your head, but it's just a continuous pounding and pounding and pounding, taking tremendous, tremendous casualties, but dishing out the tremendous casualties necessary to really hurt the Southern war effort. And, you know, the question really becomes, is this acceptable? Is this okay? And, you know, you can't really deny the effectiveness of it, but he is, you know, many of his men are being killed. Uh, so it's really, you know, that's the question. Is this okay from a moral standpoint? You know, it wins the war here, and that's really obviously pretty important too. Uh, you actually have another siege. Um, to cut off Richmond, nine months this time, I mean, as opposed to the couple months that you had at Vicksburg, uh, you know, at the town of Petersburg, cutting off Richmond once and for all here. And that's going to be obviously a big. So one thing that's really needs to be mentioned is that Abraham Lincoln actually was needed to run for re-election throughout this war. You know, the war starts right at the beginning of his presidency, and it lasts through him having to be re-elected. Uh, you know, it's just part of the system. You just that's the elections are four years, and and they have the election. Actually, it's funny because Lincoln is now going against George McClellan, who is the general that was the big thorn in Lincoln's side for not being the one to act and being overly cautious early in this war. Uh, and Lincoln, you know, was 100%, you know, for continuing this Union effort, whereas McClellan wasn't really as dedicated to the war effort. And it can be argued that this was actually one of the best chances for the South to really win this war, or at least win what they were hoping to get out of the war, because if Lincoln had lost here, uh, and it was close, especially early on in, in this in this election cycle, and you know the way the, the popularity was because of how unpopular the war had become after the emancipation and now the large casualty numbers and such and the the inflation and the draft riots and you know all of those problems uh, the war had become unpopular so if McClellan had won here he might have actually been willing to negotiate with the Confederate states to allow you know to 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 get to the terms that the that Confederates were looking for and you know Lincoln's weren't chances weren't great as I was saying until you get this other big turning point of the war when William Tecumseh Sherman takes Atlanta after another big siege uh, in September of 1864 and this actually bolsters Lincoln's support enough to win with 55% of the vote and you can see right here is an electoral college map of how kind of things took you know went uh, and you know it this is the popular vote right here. The electoral vote swung wildly in favor of Lincoln, but as far as you know, numbers going, um, it went McClellan's. Uh, well, it oh, it could have gone McClellan's way. It wasn't that it, it could have gone McClellan's way if if Atlanta had not happened. And William Tecumseh Sherman really is going to get a reputation for being absolutely. Uh, ruthless and brutal, kind of using a total war strategy to culminate his campaign through much of this Confederate territory here. And he, it's going to become known as Sherman's March to the Sea. He makes a beeline, essentially, from these captures from Atlanta, especially straight to the ocean at Savannah here, uh, and really cutting a complete swath of destruction in his path destroying everything you know useful for the south destroying farmland raiding you know these plantations uh, one thing becomes known as these these Sherman's bow ties that they would heat up the railroad lines and they would tie them into you know into bows essentially leaving them completely unusable they lived off the land uh, and eventually you know get they get across the you know, the the south here to the sea and they eventually joined to rush um, north and head to you know with grant um, going to you know, to into Virginia, hopefully 
you know, hoping to kind of crush the Confederate army from the opposite side once and for all. Uh, and you have this quote here that, right, we are not only fighting hostile armies, but we're fighting a hostile people. And we must make old, young, rich, and poor feel the hard hand of war. Now, that's a pretty tough quote, uh, you know, talking about the people um, need to suffer as much as the, the fighting people because they are helping the war effort there. They they're hostile to the Union troops. And that's one of the reasons why this brutal tactics that Sherman, uh, you know, employs going through the South. Here is just a, you know, an artist rendering of, of Sherman on his horse, you know, going through one of these towns really laying you know fire to them as they go uh burning things up and just kind of as i said cutting that swath of destruction in his path you know to savannah to ultimately head north to join the rest of the union so after lincoln wins his election it's kind of start time to start looking toward the future of of this country and realizing now the importance of winning this war and really bringing the South into back into the Union and bringing them back in effectively. And he speaks of repairing, you know, the wounds caused by the war. And you can you know, see one of the quotes from this, this address right here, right? With malice toward none, with charity for all, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. And, you know, Lincoln is going to be all really about doing whatever necessary to kind of heal up these wounds and bring the, the, the Confederacy back into the Union uh, in a somewhat of a lenient way, I suppose, just trying to not really, to really rub in the fact that they lost this war um, and to, to keep that hostility going. They want to obviously to ease those hostilities and, and, and allow these, these wounds to recover. So we're really coming to the end here now, and General Lee is going to be forced to surrender the, the Confederate Army at a place called Appomattox Courthouse. And you really, you have the Union to take the capital at Richmond, and while Lee is trying to, you know, flee General Sherman, uh, he, they, they get caught by the rest of the Union Army, and they're, they're forced to surrender, and... Lastly, you know, the l couple days later, you get the, the remaining Confederate troops, you know, surrendering to General Sherman and, and ultimately the capture of Jefferson Davis, the Confederate president. So here is a just a picture of the the surrendering. It's not a picture, sorry. It's a painting of the surrender here at Appomattox Courthouse. You have General Lee and Grant, uh, you know, coming to terms here of the surrender and, and the surrender happening. So the results and the lasting implications and lasting impact of this war uh, are going to be seen and going to have a you know, tremendous effect on the country uh, going forward. For sure, you have almost 700,000 American lives lost throughout the course of this, this war, and that is tremendous, tremendous loss of life. It's going to have a major effect economically. It's going to have a major effect socially. You have billions of dollars of worth of damage to the South, and that's going to cause, you know, a bitter resentment. Uh, they don't want to be joining the Union in the first place. They, they want to be obviously left. They don't want to be coming back, and they're going to be forced to join back after losing this war. You have millions of slaves being freed, which is obviously a major deal to the, against the South, especially uh, because their economies were based off of these slaves and the agriculture. Uh, and we're going to be talking about the how these freed slaves are going to interact with the economy in the South going forward uh, when we talk about Reconstruction. But really, you know, the lasting impacts really set the tone for the course the country is going to take in the future. And really, this this the industrial nation, the industrial North, kind of going to be now spreading out, and the industrial revolution going to be, you know, the effects of the industrial revolution, revolution going to be seen really all the way throughout the country. So thanks for listening.